Hello, good afternoon, good morning. Welcome everybody to today's webinar. It is uh, 11.45 here in the Netherlands, so I would like to start with the webinar today called Managing Flood Risk in Semi-Arid Data Scars Regions. My name is Lenneke Knoop, I'm from the Water Channel, and this webinar is part of the webinar series IHC Delft Online Seminars for Alumni and Partners in cooperation with the Water Channel. So especially a very warm welcome to all IHC alumni and partners. Now before handing over today to the speaker, I would like to um, mention a few things. So today we have another interactive webinar and the interactivity can be expressed two ways. So at the bottom right corner we have a chat box and in the chat box you are invited to um, post your questions to the speaker. So we will collect them throughout the presentation and then at the end we will pose question by question to the presenter. And also um, during the presentation some questions will be asked to you through multiple choice questions and you can simply select the answers in the pop-up screen that you will see. Um, thirdly, I would like to ask you one thing just to have an idea on who is in this room. I would like to ask if you can write down your name and the organization where you're from. So, um, our speaker today is a fresh alumni of IAT from the April batch, and her name is Adele Young. She graduated in water science and engineering with a specialization in hydraulic engineering and river basin development. And her research focused on early warning uh, systems of urban flooding in Alexandria and Egypt using hydrological data. Uh, Adele herself is from Trinidad. Trinidad and Tobago and she has worked there for eight years as a civil engineer and in this webinar she will uh, present an introduction to the concepts of flood risk management and also an overview of some suitable strategies to cope with flash floods in semi-arid regions and having said that I am very happy to hand over to Adele and I wish you a nice upcoming hour. Great, thank you so much Lenneke. Okay, and welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, I know it's quite early for some people, so those who made the effort to get up early this morning, thank you so much for being here. The topic, it's a pretty broad topic in the sense of managing floods, but it's sort of specific in, the, in, in that regard that it's looking at semi-arid and arid regions and looking at managing floods in those data scarce regions. So we have a lot to cover today. So I'll try to do this as quickly as possible and try to be as clear. To give an overview of the presentation, we'll look at the characteristics of arid and semi-arid regions. Why are they so interesting? Why do we want to study floods there? I'll give an overview of flood risk management concepts. This might be new to some people or it might be something that you've heard before just presented in a different way. And then what is involved in flood risk management, flood risk assessment, uh, what data sources can be used. We'll briefly look at some strategies that could be applied to flood flood management. And then finally we'll look at a case study um, in Alexandria. So the first question, as Lenneke asked, sorry, as Lenneke mentioned, just if everyone could um, put their put the names of their countries, that would be greatly appreciated. But the first question that I have today is, really, what proportion of the world's land surface is classified as arid or semi-arid? So if you can just put that information, just fill in the pool at the bottom, so we can see what everyone thinks. Yes, has everyone put their answers in? Okay. So just to move on with the presentation at this point, the answer is actually 33% of the world's surface is covered or classified as arid, which really seems as a lot if you think about it. And with the trends in desertification um, expected to increase, there's the, there's the risk that that number might actually increase as well. Now, if you look at this map that I have presented here, you'll see that a lot of these areas, it's located on pretty much every continent. So it's anywhere that there's a desert, there's the north of Africa, the Middle East, down in Australia, 
as well parts of China and also in North and South America. Now, these areas, what makes them so interesting is the fact that there's really not a lot of precipitation. At times of the year, they really go through um, droughts. But it also means that there's a lot of, they are also at risk of flooding. So it's a very unique situation, well, in a sense. And if you look at this table here, it shows that there really is not a lot of precipitation with less than 100 in some regions in hyper-arid regions and with a range of 100 to 300 in arid and 200 to 800 in semi-arid regions. Also to note is that this aridity index is also um, a factor of precipitation as well as the potential evapotranspiration, which means that it's not only about the amounts of rainfall that these areas um, receive, but it's also about that potential evaporation, so how much water they're also losing. So why are they so interesting? Really, they're quite unique and different from other areas because of their climate and natural geographic features. As mentioned, they have infrequent rainfall. They're subjected to droughts. There's poor vegetation in some areas, a lot of erosion, um, steep slopes in some of their catchments, and also high sediment loads in their rivers because there's a lot of deposition um, due to high trans transmission losses. And that sometimes allows um, heavy like debris to stay in the river once the next flood comes. Um, but precipitation, because they have the storms that they have are usually of smaller frequencies, um, a lower magnitude a frequency of storms, and there's a huge variation in when this happens. So you may have a huge flood one year, or a huge rainfall one year, and then no rainfall for two years, and then another huge rainfall after that. Um, these are usually short duration events with high intensity and the, the way in which the precipitation is caused is also very important because this can all either be um, caused by convection clouds which is induced by temperature, high temperatures, or because of frontal rains which is, um, which is the case in a lot of those North African um, regions along the Mediterranean. Now, Because of these characteristics, when combined, it's pretty much a recipe for flash floods. Which, which is classified as flooding that occurs pretty much within one to six hours of when the flood events occurred. These are usually very random events. They're the hydrograph, which means how the, wa the, the water is, the flow of the water is distributed. Um, it's usually a steep hydrograph and it results in smaller total flood volume. And because of that, they can be quite difficult to manage and result in a lot of damage. Now, these are a few examples of floods in arid or semi-arid regions. The first example is in China, which shows excessive flooding, um, which would have occurred after several years, of, months of drought, sorry, in this region. And the second example here is in Alexandria, uh, Egypt, which is the second largest city in Egypt. Um, they experienced a huge flood in 2015. And also in Jeddah in uh, Saudi Arabia, they also had a large flood after some time of um, dry season. And it's also important, important to note that these floods also occur in urban areas. It's not necessarily um, along river banks or other areas of the catchment, but they can also impact urban areas. Also to be noted is flash flooding in these wadi systems, which are very prevalent in Middle Eastern countries. As can be seen in this example in Israel, because of the lack of water, a lot of these rivers, they don't have water throughout the year. But when the season, that flood season comes, is actually when water comes, and with that comes a lot of debris. This example here on the right shows uh, the before and after of a flood, a flash flood which occurred in Sinai. And you can really see the disaster and the power of that flood as the road is completely destroyed here. So we're on to the second question. Based on the characteristics I have discussed, I'm wondering just how many people are in these regions, in the arid or semi-arid regions? Okay. So another reason why I ask this question is because I also want people to know that because the main these floods are associated with the characteristics of flash floods, 
it's not necessarily only applicable to arid and semi-arid regions. So a lot of what we discuss here is going to be applicable to anybody who experiences flash floods. So don't think because I'm not in a semi-arid semi arid region, this is not applicable to me. But a lot of what we covered here will also be applicable, applicable to you. So no worries there. But I see we have 25%, I believe, that are in arid and semi-arid regions. So great. Moving along. Seems to be stuck. Okay, so here we go. Looking at, just to recap, what some of those tra challenges are. We have large amounts of flood water within a short period of time. That makes them very difficult to manage and to forecast. In those regions, there are also significant ins insufficient rainfall and hydrological monitoring stations, excessive damage and loss, and due to the lack of rain, as I mentioned, there's a lot of debris, and um, that infrequency also affects a lot of the, the type of infrastructure that you have in that area, as compared to other regions, like other tropical regions, which experience a lot more rainfall. There's less urgency, in a sense. Um, and then it's not really put as a priority to really justify the cost on large infrastructure projects. And in urban areas, as I mentioned, this is, not, this is also um, prevalent in urban areas, we have other external stresses such as population increase and urbanization that increase this risk of flooding in those areas. So how do we manage these floods? What can really be done? In order to answer that question, the first thing we have to do is look at what is risk. We're really just trying to define what is flood risk and really what are the components of flood risk. So there's three main components of flood risk. The first one is hazard, which is looking at the magnitude of the flood and the probability of occurrence. Is this flood going to occur every year? Will it occur every 10 years, every two years, every month, every week? Next, look at exposure. That is looking at who or what is exposed to this flood, who is at risk. So it looks at the human activity as well as the environment. And thirdly, we look at vulnerability. So what is the susceptibility of a region to losses from floods? And vulnerability can be expressed as geophysical, social, institu institutional, or economic. Another definition of flood risk is also the probability plus the consequences of flooding. And this is also tied back into the previous definition, which looks at the consequences of flooding is expressed as ex is dependent on your exposure and your vulnerability. So they're all linked. So when looking at flood risk management, the aim is really how do we reduce this risk? And that's really done by lowering your probability, so removing your hazards, or reducing your hazards, preventing exposure to people, and then reducing the vulnerability of society. So if we can do that, hopefully the idea is that we can re remove or reduce the risk. And this is achieved through the impl implementation of several struct structural or non-structural measures, and the last of those can be either policy or financial instruments. So the flood risk management cycle is one way in which we approach risk management. So the first aspect, which is looking at pre the pre-flood measures, that has to do with anything with defense or mitigation or just pre-preparation. Pre and when looking at the operational measures, these are real time. So anything to, that happens while the flood is going on or right before the flood. So it's real time risk management. And then there's post-flood me measures, sorry, which has to do with relief or recovery. So it really encompasses all of this. But in terms of your, your approach or the measures that you choose, it's really based on your specific situation and the requirements and the capabilities of the users. Before, there was, uh, there was more of a top-down approach when looking at flood risk management, but now we're seeing the benefits of actually having more of a participatory um, sort of approach where you have input from all stakeholders. And also, because of the nature of these flash floods and these floods in these regions, because they're such quick um, and very, so unexpected, that there really needs to be a focus on uh, mitigation and warning to save lives. 
because you may not have enough time to um, save property or assets which you might have in um, other river and floods where you have more time and more warning. And lastly, an important concept to note is managing residual risk. Because the idea is that as much as you do, you may not be able to remove all risk. Therefore, it's really important to have these other measures such as having evacuation routes or flood excavation exercises that can really add towards um, dealing with residual risk. And also, as I mentioned, there's several stakeholders involved. Um, which is very important to this exercise. Which takes us to our next question. Oop, I'm sorry. <laughs> Who are the stakeholders present today? So we have meteorological, hydrological agencies, maybe disaster reduction agencies, um, water managers, consultancies, academia, and we also have the public. So I see we have mostly from academia and a few from consultancy. So great. And the public. Great. So moving on. Now, we can't discuss flood risk management without really looking at uncertainty, which is very prevalent, especially looking at the future. So there's uncertainty in the climate and is, these events are, are expected to increase. Uh, so there's also uncertainty in the population as well as um, other econo economical situations that could contribute to, to changes in the future. So in the wake of this, there has been a lot of emphasis on the need for resilient uh, strategies. And by resilience, we, um, it's a word that we hear all the time, and it's synonymous with really being able to absorb disturbances and remain functioning and recover as quickly as possible. And this is best uh, described or explained in this graph here, which shows that if you adopt like a systems approach to this, that for the first, for the first um, degree of disturbance, you would resist that, but after some time, as that increases, you really want to be able to be resilient and be able to recover. But as the magnitude of the disturbance increases, you will reach a point where you can no longer recover. And then there would be a regime shift. And at that point, you'd have to rethink how, how best to design for this or how to cater for it. But it's not only, not, in terms of resilience, it's not only limited to design or structures or infrastructure, but you also have to look at your recover, recovery capacity when looking at resilience. So you have to look at your social and financial capital, which is really important to resilience. Okay, now the flood risk assessment is a key part of, um, of flood risk management. The EU directive in 2007 they mandated that all EU countries do preliminary risk assessments as well as hazard maps and then come up with a flood risk, manage, uh, the flood risk management plan. So this first aspect is really looking at once you can define what your risk is, then you can choose best how to address these risks. And one way of looking at it is using a source pathway receptor consequence model. So the first thing is looking at the source. Now the source is something you can't really change, so you, you can't really re reduce the intensity or change the river flow or things like that. Well, so it looks at um, identifying corresponding frequency of your hazards, identifying flood extent and your depth and your velocity. So that's looking at your hazard. The pathways that has to do with overland flow of the plains, overtopping. That is something that can be controlled to an extent. And then receptors are the inhabitants, like who is at risk, the industries. That can also be managed, but most importantly, what can be managed is the consequence by these different measures that we put in. So, okay, so just to go through the quick framework of flood risk management, you define your hazards, you define your vulnerabilities. That will give you an, uh, an idea of your risk assessment. You have to collect data 
in order to do your hazard analysis and also to do your vulnerability analysis. Once you define that risk, you determine what is un unacceptable and what is acceptable risk. The unacceptable risk, then you have to plan mit mitigation measures, which could be um, land use, it could be structural, it could be non-structural, and any acceptable risk, that is something that you have to look at and co constantly look at and review. So as I mentioned, flood risk maps are very important. Uh, it's a way to visualize what the risk is. So it takes it also presents information in a way that's understandable for non-technical users, for non-technical stakeholders. So you can define a hazard map, which gives flood, flood extents, flood depths, as well as uh, velocities. This will be combined with a vulnerability index map, map sorry, which looks at probably building um, conditions. It will look at socioeconomic data. So these, are, these maps here were produced using uh, GIS data. So it also gives spatial data. So you can actually see where that risk is. And then once you overlay these maps, it gives the risk map. So once again, it gives um, a visual representation of what area is at risk. And these can be very useful in planning development, so people know where to, where to develop, where not to develop, as well as when planning evacuation routes. So one of the biggest challenges that we have in flood risk management and modeling even is really unavailable or inadequate data. And going back to arid and semi-arid areas, this is also very prevalent because of the infrequency of these events. There are not a lot of hydrological or data monitoring stations. They, because they also occur in some instances on a smaller scale, they're not necessarily um, global archives, or they're just too small to be monitored or, or, to, or, or for that information to be collected. And this, in fact, hinders how we do our, our ability to do or build hydrological inundation models. And um, of course, if we can't do, if we don't have available data, then we have we can't calibrate or validate our models. But luckily. <laughs> with advances in technology, there are now a lot more open source data sites and also there's a lot of emphasis towards using citizens as, as, as sources, so crowdsourcing data or, or science, citizen science, where we can actually collect a lot more information. So I'm going to try to cover um, a few areas and a few uh, sources of data. Now I know it's a lot of this, it might be a lot of information, it might be a bit technical, um, and in the essence of time, I'm not going to go into detail of every one of them, but I think it's important for you to have the information here, so if you want to review it later, you can always come back. Now, remotely sent data, what that is, it's really just the acquisition of any data, um, not directly, but from, from a distance, from another point. And it's really changing the way that we access data right now, especially in engaged regions where we don't have a lot of data. And this is done mostly through satellites, the use of satellites, um, in particular with precipitation data, which is absolutely needed um, in order to, to do flood modeling. There are a lot of satellites available listed here, like TRIM, uh, CMORF, or ERA interim. These are all freely available. and they are available at a 0 0.25 spatial resolution, which is coarse, but it's still quite useful in some areas. It really just depends on the area that you are studying. And it has a pretty wide global coverage, which means that it, it covers a lot of those arid and semi-arid regions. And the two latter also cover global regions. And in terms of the temporal um, resolution, that is also important um, in in flash floods, because the when you're trying to monitor intensity, which plays a huge role, you also want to have um, a, a very good resolution. So this can actually help. Uh, moving on to DEMs, which are digital elevation models, which are also very fundamental to building models. Um, there are a few sources of freely available data. For example, the SRTM, which is available from NASA, 
Um, there are two versions. There is the 90 by 90 resolution version, and then there's also the theta meter resolution. Um, these have actually are quite useful in larger catchments, um, and and it's really important to have good detail when using DEMs because if your scale or if your resolution is too large, then you may not accurately be picking up the variations in the topography. Um, and finally, there's the the AXA. This is provided by the Japanese state agency. And this is actually one of the most precise um, DEMs that we have available. But once again, it's all freely available, which is, which is the best part about it. Um, although it's not in terms of the resolution, it's not the best resolution, especially in urban areas. It may not be completely appli applicable because the resolution is too coarse. But in other regions, it can be quite useful. So that's just a little caveat that you need to keep in mind. But in terms of that, there are other sources in terms of using LIDAR data, which is light detection and ranging data. But that is not really freely available. But it is probably the most accurate, one of the more accurate, I should say, um, sources of remotely sensing um, DENs. Okay, next, we have historical flood data collection. This is also very important when you want to uh, maybe evaluate, validate or just to confirm that a flood did indeed occur. They are these websites that are available. Um, the once again, they're, they're on different scales, and it is quite tricky for smaller catchments, as because the floods are occurring on such small scales, they cannot be detected. But luckily, I was I was actually able to find some flash flood occurrences in Egypt, um, which are quite relevant here. So there are these three sites that you can actually check out, um, and they do give good information. Next, we have flood extent mapping. This also uses um, satellite data. Um, but in this, in this respect, one example is using um, these different water indexes, such as the normalized difference water index or the modified normalized difference moisture index. These are actually quite useful in terms of flood extent, which, as I said before, you can use to do um, validation or of your models. So if a satellite takes an image on the day in which the flood occurs, then using the band, you can actually use these indexes to calculate or to give a flood extent. And there are many sources of, a, of, of these bands, of this data, such as Landsat or MODIS and Sentinel. And they all have different resolutions. So you have to choose which is convenient to you or which is most appropriate. There's also the use of Sentinel-1, which is a synthetic aperture radar, these imagery, this imagery has the benefit of, or if we say the advantage of the others in, these, in the respect, that it can penetrate cloud. So if you are worried about cloud cover, then these can actually help. But this was only launched in 2014, so it's not going to give you too much historical data, but in the future, it would. These actually, in order to analyze these, you would need these different tools. Um, luckily, these tools are all freely available. There are many tutorials online that can show you how to process these images, so it's quite useful. And you can actually use them. This is an example of a, a flood extent mapping that was done during the ND, N, M -N -D -W -I. Um, for the flooding that occurred in Alexandria in 2015. So that has a theta by theta resolution. And from this, we can see that even with that course resolution, it was able to show that flooding did indeed occur. So land cover, this is another important uh, data feature that we need. And you can also use satellite information to do this using uh, the supervised land cover classification, and using the semi-automatic plugin, which is also available on QGIS, which I should have mentioned before, is a freely available um, geo-information system software. And then secondly, we have OpenStreetMaps, which is a great tool uh, to, to map locations. So we actually, at IHE, we've actually used this program quite often in terms of mapping areas. 
a lot of areas that have not been mapped because they're in very rural areas and people just haven't mapped them as yet. So we've done different mapathons where we come together and we build on these maps and there are a lot of mapping communities. So the idea is that afterwards, once this data is done, is, is, has been collected, then people can use them. Uh, you can use them in, in GIS as well to build a foundation for roads and buildings. So they're actually quite useful. Okay, now citizen observation for data collection is something that's up and coming in a sense. And what it implies is that you're using citizens as either interpreters or as censors. And why I thought it was important to really mention this here is that in in arid and semi-arid regions where we discussed, we don't have a, you may not have a lot of data. This can be used really to corroborate or to to substantiate a lot of that um, that remotely sent data that you that you're collecting. So if you're concerned about your resolution, this really allows more data to be collected or more more specific or defined data to be collected, uh, as they they can actually help with the ground truthing. And also social media mining, which means that you have access to um, YouTube videos or on Twitter. If anyone's ever reported a flood, you know, there are opportunities to look at where indeed that flood did occur, where, what was the extent of that flood perhaps, uh, what type of disruption there was, what were the impacts. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of push in the community right now to try to use this data as it is. It can be quite useful, especially when data is not available. And that can be used for water level, velocity, flood extent, land cover, and topography in some instances. Another example, um, in the US, they have a program called the Flooded Locations and Simulated Hydro Hydrographs Program, where they actually use this citizen science data and combine it with existing data to, to come up with um, locations of where flooding did occur. So if you're interested in that, you can check that out. And these are a mention of some other projects that also use uh, citizen science data. So if you're interested, you can check them out. OK, so this takes us to our question number four. What? Now. This is just to see if anyone was listening. <laughs> what is the biggest limitation of using remotely sent data in arid and semi-arid regions? I think I said it a hundred times, so <laughs> maybe everyone will get it. <laughs> and no worries if you don't get it, because this is all a learning experience, so it's fine. OK, so just moving on, the answer is actually C, the third one, which is, yes, course and temporal resolution. Because, as I said, some of those areas, um, they're much smaller than, say, large riverine floods. So you have to be very cautious when using remotely sent data. So the next question I have is, have you ever used a citizen observed data? So this is, have you ever used a flood image? Have you ever looked on YouTube to, to, to ascertain if a flood occurred? Oh, I'm seeing some news. <laughs> That's okay. So as I said, it, it's really that if some research that is up and coming now that they're using more. But there is a lot of potential because people don't realize that every time you take a picture of a flood, if you knew exactly what to look for, how to take that, that picture, it could actually be quite useful. Okay, moving on. So we're, we're, we're going to come back now to... Um, looking at flood mitigation strategies. Now, in, once again, in semi-arid and arid regions, you, you are quite limited in some of the measures that you can take. For example, it, as I said, the, the necessity or maybe the emphasis may not be there in some, in some regions because in terms of ba balance the economy of it. Because if a flood only happens every one, every one in three years, then you may not be prioritizing. But looking at the mitigation strategies that you would want to take on, they would really focus either on re reducing the hazards or reducing the exposure or reducing the vulnerability. So for example, detention basins, which are used to really store the water and to 
reduce flood, flooding downstream is a good example of a, a strategy that could be used in, in those regions, as well as clearing obstacles. So as I said, in some areas where it's the, the rivers are dry for most of the year, if there's a, a constant process of clearing obstacles and once the flood comes in, that would, prob that would most likely reduce um, carrying debris downstream. River channel um, improvements are also an option, as well as terraces or check dams in regions on slopes that can actually slow down the water. Uh, a couple, just to look at some of the other examples here, which would focus on non-structural non measures. As I, th I may have mentioned before, flood forecasting is actually a very attractive measure in the sense that it's in what we call a no regret measure. It's something that no matter what you do, if you don't, if you do it, you will see the benefits of it. And because these floods happen so quickly, um, it is a little bit more difficult to do. But as I said, you have to react very quickly. So having that warning is quite useful. And also land use planning, knowing where to where to build, where not to build. These are more long-term measures that can take place, but are also very useful. And flood insurance, which is I mean, it's something that is not necessarily available or in all countries, uh, is actually a very important measure that could be used to protect people in the future um, from, from disaster, as it really allows you to recover a lot quicker. So, in terms of the strategies for these areas, it really just depends on the climatology in the basin. As I said, it may some areas may be larger, some areas may be smaller. It depends on your socioeconomic uh, conditions. But really and truly, the preferred solution should be flexible. It should be a mixture of resilient and adaptable uh, uh, measures. And most importantly, it should cater for uncertainty. So just to, re I, I believe I mentioned some of these things here before, really you want to have things that are no regret measures where you, there's no, you're not going to lose anything by doing them and they will always benefit you. And then also having this balance of, of small scale structures, so it may not be a necessarily a large, a large dike or something, that may not, that's probably not suitable for some of these areas, uh, but really having projects on a much smaller scale, and also really an emphasis on nature-based solutions. These are ones that have multifunctional um, purposes, and they have uh, sort of environmental and societal and economic benefits. So for example, um, using these retention and detention ponds, and this could be quite useful in arid and semi-arid areas, as they can act as artificial recharges for aquifers. So that was just a few examples. Um, moving on to flash flood early warning systems, as I mentioned, is a really important measure. And in the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction, uh, early warning systems have been highlighted as a very important measure that should be implemented. And what it does is it, it allows you also to mitigate against these residual risks, as I mentioned previously, that risks you just cannot seem to design for. And you have to learn to live with these. But it allows you to recover quickly and hopefully to make you more prepared. Um, the, the approach, uh, the system to early warning system is composed of detection, forecasting, warning, and response. So it's not only just about forecasting when a flood would occur, but it's also about how you issue that warning and when you issue that warning, and where the warning is issued for. And then finally, response is really what sort of actions that you do take. And the level of sophistication of these early warning systems really just depend on the capabilities of, of the users and the technical capacity. It's also how adequate, the, how, sorry, how severe these floods are and how frequent they are. So for example, along the Rhine here, um, in the Netherlands, you would really have to have a sophisticated system because these floods happen every year. You know they're going to have these floods, and obviously the Netherlands is at risk of flooding. But perhaps in semi-arid and arid systems, you don't need very elaborate systems. So it really just depends on the risk that you have to quantify that. 
Okay. As I mentioned, I was talking about the in the Rhine. A lot of these um, systems are quite elaborate. Um, so you have you collect your data, then you can use numerical weather prediction models as well as quantitative predict precipitation forecast in order to forecast the rainfall. And then you use hydrological and hydraulic forecasting systems to forecast water levels or inundation models to further extent. And once you have that information, then you can disseminate your, your information. However, um, in arid and semi-arid areas, we don't have that data. So we, we got, it's, sometimes it's quite difficult to build these models. And they also require a long run time. And as I mentioned, because the, these are the floods occur in such a short notice, you may not have time to run all these, um, these models, especially when you use um, these quantities of precip precipitation forecasts. But these are actually quite useful, these quantitative, <laughs> quantitative precipitation forecasts, in the sense that they exist on different scales. So they can either be short term or medium term, which have to do with the lead time. So they allow you to forecast maybe three days ahead, or in respect of the medium term, they go up to four to 15 days, for example. And this really helps to um, to the longer lead times or to allow longer lead times, but there's also a lot of uncertainty available uh, well, with that. Um, there's also a, a move towards probabilistic forecasts, uh, which means that these forecasts give you more uh, give you a more probability that an event might occur. So it's, it's the, it looks at the likelihood of uh, that an event would occur. So in that respect, it it can give you the probability of occurrence of of events, and it also looks at uncertainty. So it allows you to look at the uncertainty of events as well. And right now, there are there are many of these systems around the world, but two that I'll mention here is the ECMWF, which is European Centre for Medium Weather Forecast. And as well as the NOAA, they have the weather research and forecasting model. Now, as I mentioned, with these flood forecasting systems, because you want to have a very short lead time, well, you may have a very short lead time, you want to be able to make decisions as quickly as possible. And in flash flooding, one method that is used is a threshold-based system. And this method here, this one in particular, it's, it's proposed that instead of you know, running these models, you can actually directly compare critical rainfall thresholds with the forecast threshold, with the forecast rainfall. And it will take into consideration initial moisture conditions. Um, but in some instances, maybe in urban areas, because it's so highly urbanized and it's impervious, that maybe that soil moisture condition is not as relevant, but the idea is that you can do that. And once that threshold is exceeded, then you can issue a flood warning. An example of how that is used is the flash flood guidance system, which was first developed by the US National Weather Service. And they actually, what they do is that they try to estimate the amount of rainfall for a given duration that's required to, to cause a flood. And these these warnings are issued when when they think a flood might occur. And I was actually in the states recently, and I received many of these flood warnings. And this is just an example of how they might occur. So it really it's something that can be done quite quickly, and it is very applicable to flash flood areas. And it has been done in a lot of other countries, such as in Central America and quite recently in the in the Black Sea and in the Middle East, they are also using this, this method. So, question five. What, oh, sorry. <laughs> what is the biggest hindrance to efficient flood early warning systems? And they have given quite a couple options here. So it's is it data gaps? Is it poor availability of data? Is it a lack of integration of risk information? Or is it governance or organizational issues? Okay, 
So, see everyone chiming in. Okay, great. That's nice to see. So this is actually quite interesting because I want to say that maybe this was a bit of a trick question because the answer really is all of the above. But the answer that I was really looking at was really the fourth answer, which is the lack of integration of risk information, communication, and dissemination of me mechanisms. Because the reality is, as well as you build these models and as well as you forecast, it doesn't make any sense if you can't get this information out to people and people can't respond. So while they are all very important and, and, and should equally be, um, they should be all considered, like having a proper communication and dissemination is very, very important. Based on that, I just wanted to mention this very quickly, which looks at impact-based warnings, um, which is a way that we're trying to, they're trying to move warnings in a direction where you can actually have more descriptive um, warnings. So people, it's not just about there's a flood, there's no flood, but it can actually give you an idea of what depth of water, what area, and so forth, and what the impacts are most like, most importantly. And this is an example of how it might be done operationally, and this is what is used in my office in the UK, where they combine um, impacts as well as probability in order to issue warnings. So whether it's you have a yellow warning or a red warning, so it's either severe, there's a high likelihood, or, or if it's just to um, be prepared or whether to take action. Moving on. So now we're at the point where we're going to look at the case study. So it's really everything that we've talked about so far, like how we can really apply it to an actual study. And this would have been part of my thesis um, when Alexandria, once again, they are they have a Mediterranean climate, um, but it's still based on the rate, the annual average precipitation. It's an arid climate. So it's one of those situations where they have a lot of uncertainty. So one year they'll have 300 millimeters of rainfall, and one year they, they'll have 75 millimeters of rainfall. So there's really a lot of uncertainty in terms and variability in terms of the rainfall. It's the second largest city in Egypt, and um, they have a lot. They have the largest port and industry in in Egypt, and they have a thriving tourism industry. But in addition to that, they also uh, have a lot of um, vulnerability. So there's informal settlements. Um, there's, in some instances, adequate, inadequate drainage infrastructures. And there are some low-lying areas which make them very susceptible to drainage, to flooding. Sorry. In 2015, they had a really bad flood. Uh, it was probably their worst flood that they've ever experienced. Uh, seven people died. A lot of areas were impacted. Transportation industries were impacted. And it really demonstrated a lack of resilience in the country. And what we've noticed is that that region, that Middle East and North Africa region, because of their the arid and semi-arid regions um, climates, the studies have been done that have predicted that they are going to be more exposed to flooding. This is all part of the anticipatory flood management project, which hopes to increase resilience and increased participation, uh, um, stakeholder particip participation. Um, it looks at how can you, what sort of measures that you can take before a flood that would actually reduce the impact. However, in order to do this study, there's a lot of work that needs to go into it. So part of my thesis was really looking at what sort of, what sort of first approach that we can take um, while these studies are being done. Because all now, the country, they're still at risk of flooding. So what sort of um, interim or in, um, immediate action you can take. So the idea was really to build an operational approach, um, I'm sorry, a threshold, operational threshold based early warning system. So this, as I mentioned before, would have used um, the ensemble forecast um, using these rainfall thresholds that would have been derived as well as coming up with a, a decision-based rule in order, in order to determine when to take actions or when not to take actions. And then you can characterize that in a hazard matrix that will take probability into consideration as well as the likelihood, the likelihood of a hazard and, the, and potential impacts. So the important part, another factor that was also looking at how to identify what those critical rainfall thresholds were. So because it's also a very data-limited region, as I would have mentioned, 
I had to figure out how to collect rainfall data, how to collect historical data. So I would have used uh, YouTube. I would have done social media mining to figure out when a flood occurred, um, how, how bad was this flood. So I would have also had to speak to persons in Egypt about their information on this flood, as well as um, local drainage capacity data. So this is a, this is a, a method that I use that it, it uses what data is currently available, but it can be updated once new information becomes available. So, and once you, oh, just to mention here very quickly that once you have these thresholds, the idea is that to combine it back into the risk matrix, or the hazard matrix that I showed previously, and to see how well you could have used this um, ECMWS data, which I would have used, how well you could have used that data in order to classify hazards of past, past hazards. Whether they were, there was a high likelihood of flooding or there was a, 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 a significant likelihood of flooding and so on. So this is why, as I mentioned, I didn't have any data, so I had to go online and look for floods. And I used YouTube, blogs, newspapers, and I, I was able to find that in 2011, 2010, there were floods. So I used like the historical floods for one period. So I had like a testing or calibration period, which was from 2010 to 2012. And then I used that to derive these different rainfall thresholds. So I saw in 2010 there was a there was a lot of damage um, and a lot of flooding for a 20 millimeter rainfall. And then I also looked at a flood in 2011, and this showed also significant flooding, and this was for a 50 millimeter flooding, a 50 millimeter depth rainfall, sorry, excuse me. Um, so at this point, I would have assumed particular thresholds, and this also would have considered rainfall frequency. As I said, what is the design capacity of the system? and just made some assumptions of what these rainfall thresholds would have been and assigned, uh, based on exceedance probability, assigned any different classifications. So no flooding, minimal flooding, um, minor flooding, and significant flooding. So all these different things. And as I said, this would have been limited data once again, but it's just really testing a concept here that, and how well it can really be used. Um, and as I said, my, in my study, I would not have, um, I would have seen minimal changes to the system as well as uh, soil moisture conditions did not have an impact because the system is so urbanized. So here are a couple of floods that I looked at. The same 2015 flood as well as the 2013 flood. And from here, I saw that I looked at um, forecasting up to 96 hours. And I, from this information, it showed that you really can't, ha you can't really predict anything for at 98 or 72 hours. In 48 hours, it's still not giving great results because if you look, if you compare it with the observed here, you can see that in some instances, it was able to accurately predict it. In some areas, it was not. But up to 6, 12, and 24, it did show a good um, representation of when, how extreme those floods would have occurred. In some instances, not so great, but you can actually see in this instance, when you actually had major floods, it was able to predict that. But when you had smaller flood incidents, the models did not perform as well. And just to bring this up again, looking at the flood extent, um, I was able to validate some of these flooding, some of these errors to show that flooding did indeed occur for this 2015 event. And that would have been using um, information from the drainage department as well as newspapers and the University of Alexandria. So it, it shows once again that the satellite data here, using this these, um, remotely sensed data, it was able to, to, to help um, map that flood extent. And if you have citizen science observed data, you can actually go back in now and, and fine tune some of that information that can be used to validation. Um, so here we go, final thoughts. <laughs> I've just blanked out just a few a few words, I think, a few important takeaways here, which is really, there is no, sorry, <laughs> there are many components of flood risk management, but there is no one blueprint. It really just depend, depends on what the situation was, and knowing how to approach it really depends on that. In arid and semi-arid areas, challenges with flash floods due, are challenged with flash floods due to the nature of their climate 
geo geographic and meteorological characteristics. So you have to, you always have to keep those in mind when choosing what sort of measures you use and what sort of approach you take to flood risk management. An effective integrated strategy requires the use of both structural and non-structural measures, and these can be implemented over the short term or the long term. And um, you have to cater for uncertainty, and these must be resilient and flexible measures. Uh, and in data scarce regions, as, a, as you would have seen, there are many opportunities to supplement, supplement the data gap. Uh, from my research, I would have shown that it's very, it, it is possible to predict extreme events and flooding and, and issue warnings. So this is really just a, a first step, but it's something that can be done initially and as you get more data, you can update your system. And then finally, you have options. So it's really what options are you going to take? Will you do nothing or will you wait for the data or would you try to capitalize on what information is currently available? So that's it. Um, I think I'm a little bit over time, but <laughs> I'll take any questions now. Thank you very much, Adele, for your presentation, your very clear explanations of quite a lot of content and complex um, issues. So we have received a few questions. Um, to start with, let me put myself up also. There's one question from Simon, and um, he says, Thank you for raising um, impact of floods and risks, very relevant. And he just received images from another colleague who is in Yemen, in Mukalla, showing severe flooding. And he asks, um, which organizations, stakeholders, in your experience, should be responsible for the warning of floods? Like, who should it be? National, meteo, local governments, etc. Maybe international organizations. What is your... Right. Good question, and um, really and truly, it, it, does, it is something that requires stakeholders to work hand in hand. So for example, in terms, of, as I mentioned, there would be um, detection, forecasting, warning, and response. In terms of detection and forecasting, those responsibilities are usually taken on by your meteorological and hydrological agencies, because they will have the technical capabilities of doing that. But in terms of actually issuing the warnings, what we suggest is that they work very closely with your disaster agencies, and they should work hand in hand to actually issue those warnings. So in terms of when a flood should occur and whatnot, usually I would say the hydrological agencies, but in terms of issuing um, what sort of like what what can be done, like what response would be taken and things like that to alert people. I think a disaster agency should, should be involved in that. But once again, it's not, nobody is working singularly. They all have to, have to work together. And uh, slightly <laughs> uh, related, so the pictures that were just received is from a citizen. And you mentioned in your presentation that with just a little bit of um, maybe train, training or knowing what to post and how, that um, added value could be made by the social media or the crowdsourcing of data. Um, you, meant, you also referred to several websites, but is there something that you can refer to, like an example that really worked well, something that you came across? There, there's um, a lot of literature. There's a lot of literature. Um, one of the articles, the table that I placed, um, that article is actually a complete literature review of journals and um, particular instances where they have all used um, citizen observed data. So they have used it to, to validate information. And also those projects, some of those projects are actually up and running and are associated with specific projects. So I mean, with everything, you know, within the beginning, you, everyone is um, trying to figure it out because I think one of the limitations of that right now is really how to standardize these methods of collecting data. So it's there are some there are some examples, um, and I think it's really a great opportunity to for people, you know, because people think, okay, I'm, what can I do? You know, I'm not really doing anything, but people don't realize that the potential that yeah. they actually have. Uh, thank you very much. We will also upload the presentation, so the slide that you were just referring to is for everybody to uh, view also later on. Then I have a next question from Oklaya. Is there a difference in managing flood risks in urban and rural semi-arid regions? Yeah, can you say something about that, even though your research focused on urban? 
I would say that uh, particularly because urban areas, the, 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 the drainage system exists. So you have, you don't only have, um, for example, in, in rural areas, you only have flooding probably from the rivers. So you have overflow from the rivers and that would flood. But in urban areas, you actually have um, flooding from your sewer system. So that really complicates things in a sense. It's a, the physical, the dynamics of that is, is is an added complexity, um, as well as you have more exposure, more people are exposed, whereas in rural areas, perhaps, you have a lot more floodplains, so there's not as much exposed. So there, there is actually absolutely a difference in how they're managed. So, yeah. it, it also limits your, um, the measures because you have a lot more space in rural areas, whereas in Urban areas, you're very limited in space, and you have to be very creative. Thank you. The measures that you use. And um, next question from Joanna: Is there a level of confidence you should set to decide whether or not to warn the population? Can you say something about that? Um, well, I think I think yes. I think it, it also depends because I, I mean, you can have a lot of false warnings, absolutely. Um, but I think. This is something that's built over time when you look at your these forecasting systems. And one of the important ways of monitor, monitoring like how well your forecasting systems are working is looking at how well they were able to, to monitor events. Um, and from that, you can it's something that's constantly being tweaked in terms of your thresholds. Um, so your thresholds don't stay constant. If you've noticed that um, either you're, you're, be, you're constantly getting false alarms or they were constantly being underestimated. Um, I think you can adjust that. But absolutely, um, there needs to be a level of confidence. People have to have that level of confidence yeah. in, um, in making those yeah. forecasts. <laughs> then I have a final question by Ogunbambi. So what about the influence of the Mediterranean Sea or weather on precipitation or hydrological modeling? OK. The Mediterranean Sea. Now I know. Well, I, the the case study that I did look at was um, was on the Mediterranean Sea as discussed. And one thing I did notice, or one thing I did observe about that, whereas um, in some instances, like like flash flooding might be convective, so it's it's based on like a temperature rise. Um, along the Mediterranean Sea, most of their their rainstorms or their their systems are from frontal um, rain systems, so. Whereas what that means though is that these forecasting systems they can actually um, forecast that rainfall a little bit better, I would say than say convective um, systems where uh, because they occur so quickly because of that change in temperature it's a lot harder to do that. Um, so in terms of the hydrological modeling, um, in t I'm not sure if, if they were referring specifically to developing the model in terms of data availability. But you can actually, um, you have that data available. And it, I, I do think it's, a, you, compared to other regions, it might actually be easier in that sense. But uh, once again, there is still a lot of, of variability in, in, the, in those circumstances. I'm not sure if I answered this question. Mm, no, completely. thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you very much for your presentation. If people want to stay in touch with you, I saw you shared your email address, and what I understood is that you are now also working to uh, publish your research. Um, is there anything we need to know from you for the near future? How to keep in touch? Um, no, I think, well, my email address um, is um, it's a Gmail email address, so I think I should be easily... Then I would like to thank you again, and thank you IHC Delft for all the support, and uh, thank you for all the participants to stay here throughout, and we hope to see you uh, at the next webinar. Thank you very much.